Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to 202020. Welcome to those of you joining us at home. Um, hope you're safe and healthy. And we are going to discuss two uh, questions tonight, uh, both a little bit involved. Um, of course, we're keeping them anonymous, as always. The person who asked this question is not here this evening. Hopefully, that person's watching at home. But here's the question. Could you discuss spiritual gifts? Some folks believe to be saved, you must have experienced all of them, such as, such as speaking in tongues. And so that seems to be the focus of the question about tongues specifically. So it, it does talk about spiritual gifts in general, but tongues specifically. So we're going to address um, this topic in general specifically, with an emphasis, I should say, on tongues. Now there are several passages in the New Testament that discuss the, the issue of spiritual gifts. Uh, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, but this one, this one particular passage is probably the most appropriate uh, to use in answering this question. And let me, ask, let me do the question again, just so we have it freshly in our minds. Could you discuss spiritual gifts? Some folks believe that in order to be saved, to... to be sure that you're saved, you must have experienced all of them, all the spiritual gifts, especially speaking in tongues, or i.e. speaking in tongues. So the passage that I want to look at that I think addresses this question specifically is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 11, well, be, I think verse 4, 4 through 11, Paul writing to the church of Corinth, and I need, to, need you to keep in mind what the purpose of 1 Corinthians is all about. The church at Corinth had some issues. They had a lot of issues. They had a boatload of issues. They had a lot of things that needed to be corrected. And Paul talks about this to the church at Corinth, which is a city in Greece, um, where, where the, the lower part of Greece is attached to the mainland of Europe by just a, a small, narrow neck of land. That's where Corinth was. Uh, Corinth was a, was a main crossroads of transportation, you might say, between the northern and southern parts of Europe, and also between the eastern and western parts of the Roman Empire. Uh, the sea route brought, uh, brought ships in from the west from Rome. They would uh, disembark there close to Corinth, uh, go over land, maybe load stuff on another ship, and go across the western part of the Mediterranean Sea that way. It, it saved them time, rather than going all the way around the southern part of Greece, what we call the Peloponnesus of Greece. And then north and south, there was a road, a Roman road that went north and south. Now, what I'm, the point of all this, the reason I'm talking about it, is because that affected the city and church at Corinth. Uh, they had influences from all over the world, not just the Roman Empire. They, they had a lot of pagan influences, a lot of secular influences, and this crept into the church. Much as these pagan and secular influences have crept into the modern American church as well. We have less impact on American culture than the American culture has had on the, on the American Christian church. So the same thing was true in Corinth. So the things I'm going to talk about with the church in Corinth also apply to American churches in general. They had problems with division, following different leaders. One faction in the church says, well, I follow Paul. I like Paul's teachings. Another, another faction over here would say, well, I like uh, uh, Apollos' teachings. And another group over here said, well, no, I like this person. They, they would say, I like that person. I like this guy on TV. I like that guy on the radio. I like this guy's books. All kinds of different influences in the church. And that's true of churches today. They also had problems with um, morality, sexual morality. They had problems with the, the way they observed the Lord's Supper. They had problems with suing one another. They had all kinds of things going on. One of the issues that they had was in the practice of spiritual gifts. They were not aware of them. Well, not, I shouldn't say they weren't aware of them. They were aware of them, but they abused them. They put an overemphasis on them, and some of them in particular. And Paul needed to write to correct them regarding these things. So here in chapter 12, he says, verse 4, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. What he's saying is there are different spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. 
For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally or individually as he will. Now what he's saying is this. Let me just boil it down. What Paul is essentially saying is this. There are different spiritual gifts. There are different kinds of offices in which a person needs those spiritual gifts. For example, there are missionaries, there are evangelists, there are pastors, there are teachers. There's all different kinds of offices that a person might have. Uh, you might say different ministries. Uh, there, there are people who take care of the organization of the church. Uh, people who take care of the finances of the church. People who take care of visitation in the church. People who take care of the preaching or the teaching in the church. All these different ministries, all these different areas of responsibility, each office or each ministry requires a different set of spiritual gifts. This is what Paul is addressing in Romans chapter 12. About verses 5, 6, and 7, I think it is. He lists different Gifts, spiritual gifts. Some of them, for example, the gift of mercy, which is really essential for someone who's going to make like hospital visits or nursing home visits or visiting those who are about to die and uh, all these different kinds of things. You, you need to have compassion, right? So it's, that's a spiritual gift that God gives. Uh, another one is administration. Administration, say, of a ministry. Well, a person needs to have organizational skills, and that's one of the spiritual gifts. Another spiritual gift is that of being able to preach God's Word. That's a gift, teaching God's Word. Giving is another spiritual gift. All these different things are needed in different areas of ministry. So he says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, there's different kinds of positions or ministries or offices, and there's different usages for each gift. That's what he means by different operations. Each gift is used in a different way. And then he goes on to say that God gives them to various individuals as he sees fit. Verse 11, all these work at that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally or individually as he will. So he says that God gives each person different gifts. What he's saying there is that not every believer gets all spiritual gifts. So these churches and denominations that teach, in order for you to be saved, you've got to have this spiritual gift, no matter what it is, whether it's the gift of, of tongues or, or any other gift. In order to say that, that, that every believer needs to have the same spiritual gift is in direct contradiction to what Scripture teaches, to what Paul is teaching here specifically. Because the Corinthian church believed that everybody has to have all these spiritual gifts, kind of what you're hearing in in uh, deno different denominations today. Uh, and specifically, he addresses the gift of tongues, which we're going to address in just a moment. He addresses that specifically in chapter 14 of the same book. And his point is, you can't say that every believer has to be the same. He makes a specific point in this chapter of saying a church is like a body. Every part is not the same. Uh, an eye is a part, a foot is a part, a hand is a part. There's all these different parts, and each part is needed, and each one doesn't do the same thing. His point is that there's different spiritual gifts, different offices or ministries, different workings of that same gift within each office or ministry. So you can't expect everything to do the same. You can't hold up your hand and, and, and look around with it. I can't see what's going on back there because I've got my hand pointing that way. The hand doesn't see. I can't pick up my Bible with my eyeball. They don't have the same purposes or function. So that's his point in this passage. So I'm not going to take time to look at all the other spiritual gifts, of which many he mentions here in chapter 12, and he mentions some of them in Romans chapter 12. There's different kinds of spiritual gifts, and there's diff different lists of them. <clears throat> there's quite a diversity of them. <clears throat> I'm not going to take time to mention all of these, but because this one specific gift, the gift of tongues, is mentioned in this question, let me take a few minutes to address that one in particular. What is the gift of tongues? Because I think that goes to the heart of this as well. 
when churches and denominations today teach that, well, if you're saved, you will have the gift of tongues, what are they teaching? What are they talking about? What is the gift of tongues? Well, the gift of tongues is defined very clearly in the New Testament, and we see the first uh, practice of this in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, we see that the disciples are gathered together there in Jerusalem, uh, worshiping on the day of Pentecost. Now, there's about 120 of them. We know this from uh, 1 Corinthians, cha- I'm sorry, Acts chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, it says there are about 120 believers together. And so they were gathered there together, and uh, What happened next was exactly as the Lord had predicted back in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16 when he was talking about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter uh, who would come after he left. After he went back to heaven, he said, I will send the Comforter. He'll come and he'll he'll teach you all things, whatsoever I've said to you, bring back to remembrance what I've said to you. He'll teach you all things. He's going to convict you of this and that and the other thing. In other words, he's going to have a carry on a ministry. He's got a ministry of his own that he's going to continue after I leave. And all this happens... Here, on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. This is when believers are, for the first time, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Another way to uh, refer to this, here in 1 Corinthians 12, is baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is identification with the the Holy Spirit. It all sort of means the same thing. We're immersed in the Holy Spirit. You could could just, uh, it it all ties together. It's, it's hard to describe in words what spiritually takes place, but the Holy Spirit comes to indwell each of us at the moment of salvation. That didn't happen with the early disciples. As long as they were with the Lord, they didn't need the Holy Spirit. But after he left, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. The Holy Spirit came and lived within them. And that's where we get the scripture in the New Testament later on, where he says, among other things, he says, uh, I am a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I will never leave you nor forsake you. All those are talking about the Holy Spirit living with us. As Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, ye are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We are the temple, not the church. Not a temple or a tabernacle somewhere in Jerusalem. Um, we are the temple. So when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, when they were indwelt with the Holy Spirit, whatever term you want to use, they began to speak in other tongues. Let's go to Acts chapter 2 and just look at this passage for ourselves. Acts 2. It says in verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues. Remember that phrase, by the way, filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues. You see that? Now, the word tongues is just a word that means languages. That's what it's talking about. Other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, some would look at that and say, well, that's talking about speaking in tongues. It's, it's the language that the, the, we use like in our services when we have a charismatic service and somebody stands up and begins to talk in what I like to call gobbledygook. You know, it's nonsense, right? Just guttural language, just syllables, repeated sounds. Uh, They did not speak that way, uh, although some would say that they did. They spoke with other tongues. And some would say, well, those are not human languages. They were other than human languages. But if we read on and put this in context, it goes on to say, verse 5, and there's, as it, remember as I, as I said this past week, everything in the Bible is there for a reason. Nothing is there to fill space. It's all important. Verse 5 says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Nation, people group, right? We have different people groups. You have other languages, other dialects. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. This clarifies what we just read, isn't it? Doesn't it? So we go by what the Bible says, not what we think it says, not by what we've always been taught or believed. We go by what the Bible says. Every man heard them speak in his own language, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? 
That is, they're all local guys, right? They're all from here. They all speak the same language. And how hear we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, it can't be any more clear that they are not speaking gobbledygook. They're speaking human languages, <clears throat> various human languages. Now, keep in mind, all the people who were speaking were Galileans. These are Jewish men. Uh, no doubt they knew Hebrew because they learned it in synagogue and Hebrew school growing up. They also knew Koine Greek or common Greek. That was the common language of the time. They also knew uh, Aramaic, which is a kind of an offshoot of, of Hebrew, uh, and that was commonly spoken at the time as well. So they knew probably at least two and three languages, but they, they did not know these other languages that were being represented here, uh, but all these guys heard them in their own language. It, it's a miracle of God. It's an amazing thing. And so what we're seeing here is the gift of tongues as described in the Bible, not as uh, we commonly hear about it being taught today. These are our foreign languages, and I've misplaced, let's see, what do I do with my notes here? I actually have notes. Um, there we go. Um, see where I, where I am here. Yeah, okay, because of this, because of this, this passage and other passages as well in the New Testament that talk about tongues and about how tongues were given. There are three different um, passages in the book of Acts where a group of believers got saved and began speaking in tongues. Three different instances, okay? This is one of them. Acts chapter 10 is another one, and I forget the third, the third one uh, where they spoke in tongues. But there are more passages where... Uh, believers got saved and did not speak in tongues. So this doctrine of speaking in tongues and that all, all Christians ought to be able to speak in tongues is based on three passages in the book of Acts. Which is problematic for a couple of different reasons I'm not going to go into tonight. But Acts is a transitional book. It applies to a specific set of circumstances in a very specific period of time. I'm not going to get into all that tonight. But there are three passages that talk about Believers getting saved and speaking in tongues. But as I said, there are more passages where believers did not speak in tongues. Now, keep in mind that phrase we looked at just a little bit ago. It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There are many today in other denominations and churches who will have you believe that, well, look at them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke with tongues. That's evidence of being filled with the Spirit. If you are filled with the Spirit, you speak in tongues. They go together. And it sounds good, unless you look at other passages that talk about believers being filled with the Spirit, but they did not speak in tongues. Instead, they preached the Word of God with boldness. And the word for that is prophesying. This happened numerous times. Uh, it happened, for example, with John the Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. Remember that? Now, what was he known for? Preaching the Word of God with boldness. He dressed funny, he ate funny things, but he had, a, he had a very bold ministry, preaching the gospel, right? It eventually got him killed. But that was a symbol or sign, evidence of him being filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary was another one, Jesus' mother, was filled with the Holy Spirit. What did she do immediately upon being filled with the Holy Spirit? She began to proclaim the goodness of God with boldness, singing uh, what we call Mary's song, her, her, her ma ma Magnificat. I think is what we call it, um, where she's praising the Lord. Uh, her mother Elizabeth, or uh, cousin Elizabeth, did the same thing. She was filled with the Holy Spirit, did a very similar thing. Uh, Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He began to praise the Lord with boldness. We see the same thing with Peter in Acts chapter 8, I believe, verse 4, who was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to preach with boldness and didn't uh, worry about being arrested, didn't worry about being beaten, didn't worry about being thrown in jail. All those things happened to him, but he didn't care. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's more evidence. Oh my goodness, is it up already? 
There's more evidence that, that, uh, that preaching the Word of God boldly is better evidence of being filled with the Spirit than, than speaking in tongues. But I'm going to have to stop there. We won't even get to our second question tonight. Uh, comments, questions, and discussion. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, if somebody speaks in tongues, unless there's somebody to interpret what they're saying or to understand what they're saying, they're not speaking in tongues. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you asked that because it kind of leads me into where I was going to get to next. Uh, th- because there are several other uh, ways that we can, we can know that, uh, that what they did in the Bible was real speaking in tongues and what is done today is not. Uh, let, me, let me throw this in too. I do not believe that the uh, sign gifts, uh, such as speaking in tongues and healing, uh, now I believe God still heals today, but I don't believe I can lay hands on anybody and heal them. I think that's gone. The apostles could do that. Nobody else could. Once the apostles were gone, we don't see that anymore. Uh, we don't have, none of us have the ability to heal people. And those who say that they have that power should be at the hospital instead of in the pulpit. They should be going around healing people instead of talking about healing people, right? Healing people for money is what they're doing. It's all for profit. Uh, so I don't believe that sign gift exists anymore. And there's, there's multiple evidence for, the, for that. And what you just talked about is one of them. Paul, in addressing this, this gift to the Corinthians, because they were all caught up in this, this thing about tongues. They thought everybody should speak in tongues. They were having a lot of fun with it. Um, and if, you see, if you've ever been to a service where people are speaking in tongues, if you can get over the craziness of it, if, if you can deal with it, if you are the one doing it, it looks like fun, right? They get caught up emotionally in that. And the Corinthians were. And Paul, the apostle... Uh, is trying to correct the Corinthian church regarding a number of errors, spiritual errors, theological errors that they had, and this is one of them. And so in 1 Corinthians 14, he lays down some rules for them. He doesn't forbid them from speaking in tongues, because the the, the speaking in tongues, that gift of, of tongues was still in effect when he wrote 1 Corinthians. But he restricts it and gives them four rules for speaking in tongues. He gives a whole lot of other things as well. He says, you know, speaking in tongues really isn't that big a deal. It's not that important. It's actually assigned to unbelievers, not to believers. He says that early in the chapter. Uh, he goes on to say, I'd rather speak just a few words that people can understand than speak 10,000 words in a language that nobody can understand. But those are not, that's not one of the rules. He, he gives four rules, and they are laid down the, toward the end of the chapter. Verse 27, he says, no more than three people should speak in tongues, in any service. No more than three. In the same verse, he says they should do it one at a time, not all at once. Evidently, that was a problem then. Third rule, same verse in the following verse, verses 27 and 28, he says an interpreter must be present. That's what you were just referring to. An interpreter must be present. The fourth rule, you're not going to like this one, He says, no women should be engaging in speaking in tongues. You may not like that. There's verses 34 and 35. But those are the four rules. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever been to a service where somebody was speaking in tongues or seen one? Okay. Most of you? Um, It's weird, isn't it? Now, let me ask you this. When you went to a service where they were speaking in tongues, did they follow these four rules? They don't. They don't. So the churches that are practicing this, at least the, all the ones that I've seen, whether I've seen videos of them, and there are numerous videos of them on YouTube, different places, other places online, um, or the ones I've experienced myself, they are not practicing scriptural speaking in tongues. They're not doing it in a biblical way. Not to mention the fact, and I didn't even address this, but they're, they're speaking in gobbledygook. They're not speaking foreign languages. They're not speaking real human languages. They're, they're doing this guttural, multi-syllable type stuff. In fact, some churches actually teach you how to do it. You can take classes in how to speak in tongues. 
Well, how, how is that a spontaneous manifestation of the Holy Spirit if you have to learn how to do it? So for those reasons and other ones as well, I do not believe that speaking in tongues as practiced today is biblical. Let me throw this out here too. Now, I mentioned that one of the reasons, well, I don't know if I mentioned one of this, but one of the reasons in the New Testament for speaking in tongues was evangelization. They were preaching the gospel to people who couldn't understand their language. It was a way for God to communicate to these different people groups the gospel quickly, right? These, these disciples, not just the original 11, but 120 of them, mind you, uh, they didn't know all these other languages, but they spoke them anyway, right? Now, can God do that still? He can, but is he? In the last 2,000 years, how many missionaries have gone to how many countries to preach to how many people, and during the, in the process of going to the field, how many of them have spent how many years in language school at what cost to learn the language to go to those fields and preach the gospel? Now, do you, wouldn't you think that in the last 2,000 years, if speaking in tongues is still a legitimate uh, spiritual gift of the Holy Spirit, why haven't you heard stories about how these missionaries have just suddenly gotten the gift of tongues and been able to preach in that language of the people they've been sent to without going to language school? It doesn't happen. That's just one of many evidences that tells me that gifts is not in operation today. Now, God, can God still do that? Absolutely he can. God can do whatever he wants to do. Just like with healing people. I have seen people healed of deadly diseases. I've seen it. I've been there when it happened. I can't heal him, but God can heal him. God can do whatever he wants to, right? God can give somebody the the, the gift of tongues today. So if you were asking me, is the gift of tongues still in effect today? I would say, well, God can still do it, but I don't believe it's, it's it's one of the spiritual gifts of the New Testament. At least not as manifested today. Uh, as practiced today by Christian churches. Not only that, but in 2,000 years of church history, you don't see any uh, speaking in tongues recorded in any Christian histories until about 1900. The Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles is probably the first time since the book of Acts that 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 that's been the case, and that was gobbledygook. That even then, that wasn't foreign languages. And they, did, they all spoke at the same time. Uh, they, they did not follow these rules that we just discussed in 1 Corinthians 14. So I don't believe that's legitimate anyway. But in 2,000 years of church history, you don't see any recorded instances of people speaking in tongues. But I went way beyond what you asked me. So someone else, comments and questions? As far as spiritual gifts go, the verse that you mentioned about the eye and the body, do do the spiritual gifts work in the same way, or how would you explain that? Well, uh, I I would say like like your body has different parts. You've got a hand that can grasp things, do things. You've got an eye that can see things. You've got a nose, or most of you have noses that can smell things. (laughs) Uh, You have a mouth that can speak things. in a, a, a church is a body. We have different parts in the body. There are people who sing. Um, they, there are people who clean. There are people who organize. There are people who visit. There are people who teach. Uh, we have all these different things that are going on in a church, and each, each area of ministry is like a different part to the body. They all do different things. Uh, and each part of the ministry, each area of ministry requires different spiritual gifts. As I indicated earlier, those who go out visiting really need to have the gift of mercy. Romans chapter 12. That's compassion. Um, those who take care of the, of the organization, administration of the church need to have the gift of administration, or the gift of organization. Um, those who teach should have the gift of teaching. Uh, there's all different kinds of, of gifts that are used in specific ways in different ministries, and I think that's that would be how I would apply that. You mentioned 
the laying of hands on people to heal. And a lot of times folks, when they pray, they like to have people gather around them and put their hands on them. I'm having a hard time asking the question because I don't quite know how to word it, but how do you put up that line between just laying hands on people to pray where it becomes trying to heal people with your hands on them while you're praying? I know some folks try to make that happen sometimes. Okay. Does that um, make sense? It's, it's yeah, I think, I think so. Um, there's no problem, no restriction about laying hands on somebody and praying for them. In fact, when we ordain somebody, that's what we do. Um, it doesn't have the same, well, let me, let me hold off on that thought for just a second. But laying hands on somebody it just gives you a physical connection with them. It helps them to feel more supported. Um, it, it doesn't convey anything spiritual, but it, it just is a kind of a, a, a tangible dem- demonstration or show of support for the person. Um, what I started to say earlier is that um, laying hands doesn't convey anything spiritual from you to them. Now, with the apostles, it did. When an apostle's office was totally different, and how God used an apostle was totally different than how he uses people today. There are no apostles today. So I need to repeat that frequently because there are a lot of people who claim to be apostles out there. And the Bible talks about those who falsely claim to be apostles. And we still have false apostles today. You'll see churches listed and signs, church signs everywhere where they will list the name of the church and then they will say the pastor is apostle so-and-so. That is totally unscriptural. Or a prophet. prophet Yeah, a prophet, yeah. Um, Now, if they use prophet in the right sense, it's okay. Now, a a prophet is someone who foretells, not someone who foretells. You you call yourself someone who prophesies the future, you're putting yourself in very dangerous territory because the Old Testament has a test for prophets. Uh, If 100% of what you predict comes true, then you're a a godly prophet. But if 100% doesn't come true, then under Old Testament law, you're toast. Okay, uh, but uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that an apostle had a very, very spiritual and special calling of God and, and ministry of God. Apostles were able to lay hands on somebody and impart to them spiritual gifts and convey to them spiritual things that could not happen otherwise. God used them for that purpose. When we lay hands on, on somebody it, with the idea that we can do what they did, it's, it, it's almost sacrilegious, not to the apostles, but to God. Because God doesn't work that way today. The, the apostles were a very, very special office. And there are only 12. And we see that in Revelation, when John sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, it's got, it, it, there's only 12 apostles that are mentioned. The, the, the foundations and and gates of the city, and there's only 12 of them, um, the uh, 12 tribes of Israel, uh, 12 apostles, they're represented, and there are no more than 12. Um, never will be. So when we lay hands on somebody, we just do it as a, as a token of tangible support. But don't think that there's any efficacy spiritual flow between you and them. Like when uh, the woman touched the hem of Jesus' garment to touch him, and he, he, he was in a crowd of people, and he said, who touched me? And the disciples said, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. This, they're crowded. You know, it's like being on the fairgrounds back in the old days when we could all be on the fairgrounds. <laughs> he said, everybody's bumping into each other. What do you mean who touched you? He says, no, somebody touched me. I mean, they really touched me because I perceive that virtue is gone out of me, is what he said. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, The apostles, the real 12 apostles, could lay their hands on somebody and virtue would flow from the apostle to the person who's had their hand, being laid hands on. Uh, You don't see that today. So when we see these guys on TV touch somebody and then the person gets propelled backwards like a lightning bolt, zapped them back, that's Mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff, right? Oh, yeah, that's that's all bogus. Okay. It's set That's up. all bogus. It's set up. Uh, I, I can show you how it's done. You want to come up here? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> so it's a setup. Set yeah, it's a setup. Yeah. 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 It's, it's all for show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be somebody that's doing that or like 
the churches that are doing all the speaking in tongues, definitely not the way that God intended it for it to be. Isn't that like blasphemy? You know, blasphemy against God because they're making people believe that God is, you know. Working through them. It, it borders on it. I, I'd probably be closer to calling it sacrilege. Um, you know, making that which is holy, unholy uh, type of thing. Uh, but it, but it's, it's close. It's close. It's, it's, uh, it's secularizing the things of God. It's, it's uh, as Paul said, making merchandise of people. It's all for show. It's all for money. It's all for fame. It's all for power. It's all for human purposes and not for the glory of God. When it kind of makes you think of what Lucifer did. <laughs> Mm -hmm. He wanted to be like God. So I look at these people that are doing these things, you know, and saying that they can heal people and they can do that. They're trying to make themselves a God, which they're not. Well, and you'd be surprised how many of them actually believe that they are little gods. Uh, some of these TV preachers that, that are very popular, and if I were to name them, every one of you would recognize every name I would mention. Um, they teach that we can become little gods, small g gods. And they say that, and they will quote scripture to make their point. Um, but this is exactly what Satan's lie was in the Garden of Eden. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And some of them do claim exactly that, thinking they are of God. And teaching that if you are the kind of Christian you should be, and giving enough money as you should be, and faithfully praying and reading your Bible and do all the stuff you should be that you too can be little gods. Uh, they will not say it out loud like I just said it, but it's, it's there in their teaching. You got one online? Yeah, I actually have a couple. Um, so Brother Emmanuel asks, the non-intelligible language practiced by some churches is not the biblical uh, speaking of in tongues. It's something else. Uh, I don't know what to call that. Do you know? Well, I call it gobbledygook. <laughs> I don't know what else to call it either. It's, uh, the, the, the technical term, the theological term is glossolalia, which to me means, yes, exactly, gobbledygook. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but that's what it's called. Uh, it's just, it's nonsense. It's baby talk. And then uh, Ms. Felicia asks, how can you explain James chapter 5, verse 14, uh, about anointing the sick with oil? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I can do it in three minutes. Um, but there is uh, some good evidence that uh, shows that he's, he's talking about... Uh, let, me, let me look at that again. John chap uh, James chapter 5, right? I want to make sure that I've got this correct. I don't know what I'm talking about. It's been a long time since I've looked at it. James chapter 5. Verse 14. Okay, he's talking about, if you look at verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Uh, he also talks about... Um, Yeah, verse 19, uh, talking about uh, Elijah as an example, about the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He goes on to say, verse 19, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. There's, there's some evidence to, to show, uh, in, the, in putting it in context, I seem to get the idea that the reason this person is sick is because they are in sin that God is, is uh, chastising this person with illness because they have willfully and deliberately gone astray and God is correcting them, spanking them to bring them back into the fold. And as we uh, already know, and we can talk about it in another 2020 sometime, if you continually, willfully, deliberately disobey God long enough, he can take you home early, right? There's a sin unto death, right? And, it, and, and for that, he, we're even told not to pray for that if a person's coming to sin un, unto death. But here he's talking about uh, anointing a person with oil. I see that as in the case of someone 
who has sinned is, and knows that God is judging them for the sin, and he calls for the elders of the church. It doesn't say that the elders of the church are to go to him and seek him out. He's to call for the elders of the church. The idea is that he realizes the error of his ways. He wants to repent. He wants to confess his sins to the elders because he can't come before the church. He's too sick to do that and repent. And so they anoint him with oil and pray for him, lay his hands on him, pray for him, and he repents and comes back to the Lord. That's the context of what, what I see in that chapter that's going on there. So I don't hope, hopefully that clears it up. That's a three minute and 10 second <laughs> response uh, to that question. But it's a, it's a good one for further discussion another time. We'll get to our next question uh, next week. Uh, I'll just go ahead and give you the question because I've already got it ready. Sometimes I can't announce the question in advance because I don't know what it is yet on Sunday morning. I don't know until Sunday afternoon sometimes. The question, well, the primary question for next week, I'll add another one somewhere too along the way, but it's this. What is a true reprobate mind and can they ever repent? What is a true reprobate mind and a person who is reprobate, can they ever repent? So that'll be the question, the primary question, the first question for next Sunday night. And as I said, I'll add another one sometime this week to that. So let's close in prayer and ask God to bless us as we go forth. Please be safe on the roads. I know the main roads are okay. The side streets are still a little slick. So be careful tonight going home. Father, thank you so much, again, for being who you are, for loving us as we are. And as we prayed this morning, we pray once again. Thank you for loving us enough not to leave us where we are, but to help us, Father, to be conformed to the image of your Son. That you would add those things in our life which are not there and take away those things which shouldn't be there. And help us, Father, to be listening to you as you deal with us in those areas. I pray, Lord, that your will would be done in our lives and our dealings with others from now until the next time we meet. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, and with thanksgiving. Amen. Good night, and God bless you. Well, you can read it in the morning paper, hear it on the radio. The crap that's a sweeping our nation, this whole world is about to go. We need a good old case of salvation to put the love of God in our souls. We need a whole lot more of Jesus and a lot less rock and roll.